afternoon, and I'm so glad to see so many of you come out for this event. And I am so sorry that I cannot stay here for the entire time. Uh, I had something on my calendar that could not be moved, but I did ask them to wait so that I could have an opportunity to at least say hello and to welcome you uh, to this conversation and poetry reading. And I have the distinct honor of being able to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Uh, let me tell you about who they are and they are very dynamic and they'll certainly take it from here. But you've come because you wanna hear what they have to say. So let me give you a little bit of background on each one. First, I'm gonna introduce Michelle Watkins. Dr. Watkins serves uh, as an assistant professor of theology and religious studies here at USD, teaching courses in early church tradition, black and womanist theologies and religion and hip hop. Now there's a topic you don't see every day. Uh, when I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Watkins when she was interviewing for her position here and I was just so impressed with the breadth of knowledge and the enthusiasm that she brought to her scholarship. She is a native of Chicago, just like I am, and a daughter of the United Methodist Church. Dr. Watkins is a scholar, pastor, activist, shaped by the Black Freedom Movement tradition. She is presently working on her monograph, tentatively titled, Deification for the Desacralized, which places womanist theologians in conversations with Greek patriotists and orthodox theology to construct a meaningful interpretation of Eastern doctrine, doctrine of theosis. That is quite a title and I'm looking forward to you getting that done and people finding out how expansive your big brain really is. So welcome to Dr. Watkins. I also wanna introduce Alexis Jackson here hailing from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Alexis V. Jackson earned her MFA from Columbia's University, Columbia University School of the Arts and her Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Messiah College. Jackson's work will be published in Jubilant and Locked Horn Press's Read Ritual Anthology. And her first book, My Sister's Country, was selected by Erica Hunt as the second place winner of CORE Press Institute's 2020 Poetry Prize. That is quite an accomplishment, congratulations. This collection is a celebration of an ode to black women as Jackson places the words of black women in red, thus inviting readers to recognize black women's lives as themselves sacred text. The collection will be published in fall of 2020. Jackson has also served as a reader for several publications, including Callaloo and Bomb Magazine. And her interests include the tradition of black women poets, womanist theology, poetic form and womanism. Jackson lectures in the University of San Diego's English department and teaches poetry at Messiah College. I wanna welcome both of you here. You have heard um, their backgrounds, which are extremely impressive. And now you're gonna get to hear them in action. So I wanna welcome my colleagues and our students, and I want you to have a wonderful time with this um, uh, event this afternoon. It is being recorded, so I will have a chance to see it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to introduce you. Ladies, you have the floor. Good evening, I'm so happy um, to have the privilege of discussing this beautiful poet with you all. Um, I'm going to do a teach discussion, sort of of who she is. I don't want to assume. Um, I know that our audience is primarily students this evening, which excites me. Um, and so for that reason, I want us to have a really good understanding, a solid understanding of who this figure, this important poet was and is, and why we begin this conversation with, uh, won't you celebrate with me? Um, this poem in particular um, has been used as a type of rallying cry, I will say, for Black women, um, for women as well in general. Uh, but oftentimes we miss, I think people celebrate so much um, 
the final two lines that we miss a lot of what is happening contextually in the poem with the inner workings of the form um, and the syntax. Uh, but also we miss what Clifton uh, was actually telling us about herself as well. So that's what we'll look at a little bit this evening. So Lucille Clifton, 1936 to 2010 gives you a context about her life and all that she's seen within those times. I'm gonna speed through this. I don't wanna make it crazy boring. I'd like to get to the important stuff, but I want us again to set context. Any of my students who are here know that that is uh, one of the things that I harp on initially when it comes to writing assignments. I'm like, I need the context. So here we go. Lucille Clifton was born at Thelma Lucille Sales in Depew, New York to Samuel L. and Thelma Moore Clifton. I'm sorry, Thelma Moore, yeah, uh, not Clifton, Sales. Um, her name, as we all know her to be, uh, Lucille Clifton, um, came to be because both she and her mother just didn't like the name Thelma. That simple um, in that way. She also had some autonomy when it came to declaring herself and who she was. Uh, what's important about that as well is that Lucille is her paternal grandmother's name, uh, significant because her father uh, told her, so she's going based off of that, uh, her father often said that her grandmother was the first Black woman to be legally lynched in Virginia. And so Lucille felt a closeness to that name, honestly, because she liked it more than Thelma, her mother's name, um, but also because Lucille means light. And she found a lot of meaning uh, within that name for herself. Um, she grew up in Buffalo, New York. These are very white spaces during this time. So that is significant. She did experience and see uh, prejudice, racism, segregation firsthand. Um, she was the first in her family to graduate high school, though both of her uh, parents were extremely literate and well-read. Her mother was a poet. Uh, one particular instance she never forgot was her mother wanting to publish poetry and her father forbidding it and her mother burned all of her all of her work that the same night. So that was something that stayed with Lucille Clifton. Uh, her father was a great storyteller and told her stories often and so both of her parents uh, read and were extremely well read even though they did not finish high school. Um, she went to Howard University for two years and uh, left and then went to SUNY Fredonia where she finished her degree. Um, during that time, she also met uh, her husband, Fred Clifton, and she had six children over a seven year period. Um, moved to Baltimore, Baltimore in 1967. So she, I think she only had about four of her children at that point. And then her first poetry manuscript was published in 1969 under the title, Good Times. At that point, she had um, all six of her children under the age of seven. Uh, that also tells us a bit about the way she writes her poems. Um, she's known for writing short poems and I'll get into that, I have that slide. But she says she did that because she had six children. She's like, there's no way I could sit down and write long poems and study uh, these poems while I'm taking care of six children. Um, and that is significant. Uh, she then in 1970, a year later, uh, was featured in Langston Hughes, The Poetry of the Negro, a very important anthology. Um, she became poet in residence at Coppin State College in Baltimore. And I have all these years from 1971, 1974. Uh, 79 to 85, she was poet laureate of the state of Maryland. And um, her husband passed in 1984. Where, and at that time, she then moved to uh, UC Santa Cruz, so she came out here um, and finished uh, her work, well, not finished her work, but did a lot of work um, within UC Santa Cruz. These are, I'm running through because she's done a lot in her life and you'll see uh, in the next slide. Um, significant 1994 was her first cancer diagnosis um, and 2000 was her second and third cancer diagnosis. Uh, she had breast cancer um, and was a survivor, uh, but then had breast cancer again um, and then uh, also renal cancer, which eventually, uh, after a long battle and also um, a kidney transplant, she did pass in transition in February on February 13th of 2010, which is significant for her um, because it was the 51st anniversary of her mother's death. Um, and she passed at the age of 73. Some of her accomplish accomplishments, there's a lot on the slides, but I, I promise you, you need this. Um, she, her professorship, I went over some of this, Coppin State, UCSC, 
Memphis State University, sorry, this is blocking the side. Here we go, Duke University as distinguished visiting professor. St. Mary's College of Maryland as distinguished professor of humanities and Dartmouth College. Um, also, she is uh, the first, and I don't know if she's the only, but she absolutely was the first poet um, to have to be nominated for a Pulitzer in the same year. She had two main, two different books, both nominated for Pulitzers in the same year. Um, Blessing the Boats won the National Book Award. She served as the State of Maryland's Poet Laureate, 1979 to 1985. We spoke about that. Won the prestigious National Book Award for Blessing the Boats. I have it twice. Uh, 2007, the Poetry Foundation awarded her the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, which is one of the most prestigious honors um, for American poets. She was the first Af African-American woman to receive the award since its establishment in 1986. So she's doing? still doing a lot of I knew first, what time. Right? We see that here. I think somebody said it was a four. And I said, what the um, <laughs> Okay. Um, she served as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. And she was invited to read at the White House. Uh, she was invited by Jimmy Carter to come and read at the White House. She also won an Emmy. Exactly what for? I couldn't. I could not find that. But she was an Emmy Award winner, and she also has a number of honorary degrees. So, if nothing else from everything I just said, she's a highly decorated, important Black woman poet who identified as such. The work. What are people? What is her work known for? compressed free verse lyric with short iambic trimeter line. Now, every single line is not explicitly iambic uh, trimeter. Some of it shifts, but that's what she's known for. Like I mentioned, she had six children um, all very close together. So she didn't have time to sit and write these longer poems. Now, what she does have are longer poems written in sections. So we have pieces that we put together. Um, one of her more famous ones was written later in her life and it's one for 9-11. So she has a series poem on 9-11, which if you haven't read it, um, it's devastatingly beautiful. Um, she writes it for her granddaughter, actually. So some of it is for her granddaughter. Lack of punctuation. Her case is often uh, lowercase. She doesn't do capitalization often. Um, precision, Black life and racism, women's issues, family life, human connection to nature, human capacity for evil, Biblical Illusions, an Afterlife That's Active and Rich, and World Injustice and History. She's very much uh, a poet of her time. And what I mean by that is she writes often about what is happening. Um, and I speak in my class about how that's important when a poet is attempting to, or is actually positioning themselves to be seen as a, a poet of the people. We read that, my class has read that June Jordan article. Um, but also what that means in terms of uh, lining your, positioning yourself for uh, recognition and importance and also speaking to the people uh, for whom you want to speak and to whom you would like to speak. Okay, so critiques of her work. Let's get into it. Uh, critic James Miller has said of Clifton's work, Lucille Clifton's world is both earthly and spiritual. In her capacity as both witness and seer, she looks through the madness and sorrow of the world, locating moments of epiphany in the mundane and ordinary, and her poetry invariably moves toward those moments of calm and tranquility, of grace, which speaks to the continuity of the human spirit, right? Sounds beautiful. Keep it moving. Hakim Arbuti says, in everything she creates, this Lucille Clifton, a writer of no ordinary substance, a singer of faultless ease and able storytelling, there is a message, no slogans or billboards, but words that are used refreshingly to build us, make us better, stronger, and whole. So we see, um, sorry, I misplaced you all. We see uh, some continuity here, right? She's this great singer, this great storyteller who is getting to, at the heart of things and building us and making us better, right? Toni Morrison critiques that actual critique. Uh, the late, great Toni Morrison says of Clifton, accolades from fellow poets and critics refer to her universal human heart. They describe her as a fierce, caring female. They complement her courage, vision, joy, unadorned, meaning simple, mystical, poignant, humorous, intuitive, harsh, and loving. I do not disagree with these judgments, yet I am startled by the silence in these interpretations of her work. There are no references to her intellect, imagination, scholarship, or her risk-taking manipulation of language. 
To me, she's not the big mama or big sister of racial reassurance and self-empowerment. I read her skill as that emanating from an astute, profound intellect, characteristics mostly absent from her reviews. The personal courage of the woman cannot be gainsaid, but it should not function as a substitute for piercing insight, embracing intelligence. My general impression of the best of her work, seductive with the simplicity of an atom, which is to say highly complex, explosive, underneath an, ap sorry, an apparent quietude. This is significant as we're discussing Lucille Clifton's um, impact, specifically this poem, in the lives of Black women, right? This is one particular way, and we'll get to it, but there's a, a self-determination, a self-awareness, and um, a reclamation of the self that occurs in the poem we'll be looking at that I cannot read to you all for copyright purposes, but I've managed to get some lines in, so we'll look at it together. Um, but there's something there um, like I said, that requires a self-awareness, necessitates it. And we see some of that in just the way people and folk talked about her, all right? There was a, as Toni Morrison discusses here, there's a celebration of her as this poet who comes in and fixes everything, right? And just makes us all feel great. Um, but people don't often praise her intellect and what she's actually doing in the poetry. And that's what we're gonna talk about today so we can resist um, placing her in that trope um, of the, mammy character, uh, the mammy trope, which is where she often gets placed. We're not gonna do that today. We're going to celebrate her um, and the work she's done. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of some of her work. I gave you all that information. Now I want you to actually just sit with me in some of her work, but in just little excerpts before we get to the poem, right? So this a particular poem is from Donor in 2000. I think of the pills the everything I gathered against your inconvenient bulge, and you, my stubborn baby child, hunched there in the dark, refusing my refusal. So first off, you see that there's a lack of capitalization, right? She's putting everything on the same level. Um, nothing is uh, better or more than anything else happening. She's big on that, like the world and the earth and where we all are positioned in connection to one another. Um, but here she's also, as I mentioned, um, concerned with women's issues. This particular poem, she's talking about receiving a kidney from her daughter. Um, and she also has a poem called The Lost Baby Poem. She openly speaks about um, abortion. She openly speaks about women's rights. She openly speaks about the struggle she has with making some of those decisions, right? She had six children. Um, and she has a poem where she talked about in The Lost Baby Poem, the lights being turned off. And if that baby would have been born, they would have been born the year that they were struggling to pay that bill. So here in this particular excerpt, we see her talking about um, actually trying to, the inconvenient bulge of her pregnancy and what she thinks of as her daughter um, is giving her her kidney, is donating the, her kidney to her mother. And she's like, I think about the times um, that I was trying, I had gathered everything against your inconvenience and you hunched there refusing my refusal. Right, she, she's able to, again, precisely get at exactly what that feeling experience is in just these short amount of lines. Hag writing, also a, a excerpt from one of her poems. For those of you who don't know, a night hag is often um, associated with night terrors and those types of episodes. She says here, something hopeful rises in me, rises and runs me out into the road and I lob my fierce thigh high over the rump of the day and honey, I ride, I ride. This is also, um, again, thinking of reclaiming and redefining uh, the self as a, as a Black woman. What she's doing here is saying, yes, there's something that is trying to, you know, night terrors can paralyze people as well. Um, this night terror that's coming for me. And at the end of the day, she is triumphant, right? I lob my fierce thigh high over the rump of the day. And honey, I ride, I ride. Uh, one more, dialysis. Until they threaten to destroy the heart they loved in my dream, a house is burning. Something crawls out of the fire, cleansed and purified. In my dream, I call it light. After the cancer, I was so grateful to be alive. I am alive and furious. Blessed be even this. She ends with a question, which she does often. That's another one of her motifs. But here in Dialysis, we see her talking about um, one of her 
everyday experiences during, as I said, like the toward the end of her life, her long struggle with cancer. Um, dialysis was something she had to do with um, as a part of her treatment. And so she's here talking about how she questions what it is to live like this right now. She's happy that she's alive. She's grateful that she's alive, but she's also furious. And we see that in the line break there. I am alive and furious. Blessed be even this. And there's a question mark. Is it, is it blessed to be in this fury? Um, is it blessed? Is it a blessing to be alive and have access to this? She doesn't know. And she's questioning all of that. Also, sorry, until they threatened to destroy the heart they loved in my dream, a house is burning. Again, talking about love here and a threat to destroy her. Oh, I did want to talk about this. Sorry, I lied. There is one more. <laughs> America made us heroines. This is called Black Women. America made us heroines, not wives. We learned the tricks to keep the race together, but had to leave our men to find themselves. And now they damn what they cannot forgive. We hid our ladiness to save our lives. Again, I had to take excerpts from this poem. This is a poem where she's specifically addressing Black women. The title tells us that America made us heroines, not wives. We learned the tricks to keep the race together, but had to leave our men to find themselves. There's a, a way that, as I specifically mentioned with um, the mammy trope, that she is resisting that even here. We had to leave the men to find themselves. It is not our job to help them find themselves. So we left them to find themselves and now they damn what they cannot forgive. We had to hide our ladiness to save our lives. Significant, I think that we move from this poem on into the actual poem, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Where she's celebrating, right? When she addresses black women, she's saying we had to do what we had to do. To, to save our lives, right? Hide our ladiness and now look at everyone else condemning us for it. But here's a celebration of reclaiming that, renaming it and reclaiming that. So the poem begins, won't you celebrate with me? But I have shaped into a kind of life. I had no model. But we get here in the introduction, like I said, I wanna pay attention to what she's doing with the form, um, what she's doing with the line breaks, what she's doing with the syntax. Won't you celebrate with me? but I have shaped into a kind of life. I had no model. When she says, won't you celebrate with me? There are some critics who say, oh, she's timidly asking. Um, I believe it's on the contrary. She's actually give, making a tongue in cheek indictment of the individual. If you won't celebrate with me, what does that say about you? That you're one of those people that won't celebrate with me. It's an invitation, but also an indictment, right? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? Um, the question is also, if you are not able to celebrate with me, um, if you are not me, um, do you understand why I had to shape this into a kind of life? And are you part of why I had to do that, right? There's a lot happening within this first initial question that is spread out over three lines. So we get the invitation, won't you celebrate with me? What I have shaped into. That line break is significant because she's talking about shaping herself. Right, of course, we read it all together as a sentence, that's beautiful, but the poetry can often happen with the line break. And that choice to break it there, what I have shaped into, forces the reader to focus on what she has shaped into. Who has the speaker become? There's this shape-shifting um, discussion here, but also that it ends in this poem. I have shaped into this, this voice that is presenting this question and invitation to you. And then she says, I had no model, right? Um, Touching on that comes at, touching on that specifically when it comes to black women and um, creating a self, I'm going to reference something I don't have a slide for, but stay with me. Uh, Hortense Spillers, uh, black feminist, famous black feminist penned, uh, it was published in 1971, Mama's Baby Papa's Maybe an American Grammar book. Um, and in this particular very important text, she talks about the flesh versus the body. She introduces this theory. What she says with that is that black women did not have the space to have uh, a body. They were seen as flesh, right? So what happens, what does that mean? That means that a lot of what we gave, us, what was societally allowed to women, right? Women should be protected. Women don't um, do this type of work was not extended to black women. Uh, I taught a class where we, we read R. Nig, and uh, in that particular text, 
we see the character Fredo discussing that very experience where she speaks about um, her mistress, so her owner, saying, oh, well, she can do the work of, of, she's great because she can do the work of two men and she also has the strength of a boy and she can also do housework because she has um, the facade of a woman, right? So there's this way that she doesn't have access to any real category because she's seen as flesh, as chattel. And so black women in America specifically um, in this particular context is what we're talking about when there's no kind of model. You're told you're not able to be a woman you're told that you don't really hold place as a citizen or a human being. So what do you see of yourself? It's what you dream to be. You have no model. Moving on, she then says, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. I touched on that already, what that means. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up, right? That literally just piggybacks off of what I just said. In the previous slide, you don't have any model. There's no blueprint. There's no one saying this is what you grow up to be, right? What you grow up to be is chattel. What you're born to be is chattel. What you grow up to be is less than a citizen. Um, what you grow up to be is someone who always is going to have to fight to be seen um, as someone worthy of the recognition of human. And so she's like, well, that doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> and so as I'm reclaiming myself, I, I had to make it up. Won't you celebrate with me? Like celebrate this reclamation. Look around you. Look at who I'm saying I am. Won't you celebrate with me? Um, born in Babylon is of course an illusion. I said, I listed all those things that uh, all of the themes we see in her work. But born in Babylon is a nod to um, in scripture, uh, Babylonian captivity, right? And so those who are born in captivity don't have that connection to their homeland, right? To that lineage. Um, and they're also between the space of liberation. So they don't have connection or, or memory of even existing in their own homeland. And they also are waiting for liberation. They're waiting for freedom from captivity. Captivity. So she's saying, I was born in Babylon between these two places. And I was also both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I had no choice but to make it up. Um, she also, one theme that we'll see in her work often, she has a poem about it called Amazons. Her father uh, told her that she was the child, uh, she's a, a product of Dahomey women. Like she comes from a long line of Dahomey women. Excuse me, the Dahomey Amazons um, didn't even call themselves that. That was what French uh, colonizers called them. But uh, they called themselves a name meaning loosely translated to um, our mothers, which I think is beautiful. But uh, they were warriors, uh, warrior women, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, it, people believe they were from Benin, right? Um, and they were exactly what I just said, known to be some of the most lethal warriors that existed. And so it's significant that she sees herself as that here, being born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what does she see to be except herself? Because her lineage tells her she's something else than what her presence is, her present is telling us, telling her. I'll skip this, but this is an example. Uh, this is an actual text. Psalm 1, I can't see, 37, um, where we see what it means to her to be born in Babylon. And she's nodding to this. I'll read a little bit of it. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If, you, I, for, if I forget you, Jerusalem, May my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Something significant about this, um, again, she's able to, this is why I said precise and concise, she's able to get all of that in just by saying born in Babylon. Like that is the skill level that she's working with here. So I think that's important that we get the nod to all of this. Um, that's why uh, Toni Morris said of her, um, the, sorry, I can't remember the quotation, I just saw it, uh, the simplicity of an atom, right? It seems simple. You can read it one time through and say, oh, this is great. But if you go in and study, if you go in and look at the components of an atom and how atoms make up everything, it's, it's quite uh, an accomplishment, for lack of a better term. And then the rest of the poem goes here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Again, if we look at 
the significance of the Dahomey women to her in particular, we think about, I believe it was in 1971, I know it was in the 70s, the last known Dahomey woman passed and she was 100 years old. Um, and so the truth is she believes that she's come from these, these women, right? That she is still in existence today. Um, but thinking about all that has happened uh, to these women and to black women in general, right? This, uh, the Dahomey women are done away with when the French successfully overtake them. And then colonization happens. <laughs> Everything else we know to be true happens. Her parents are the pro products of uh, the great migration. Um, and even today, the, the threats to black women's lives that are ever present, she's like every day, something has tried to kill me and has failed, right? I still exist. We still exist as black women. We are still here despite um, everything else. So won't you celebrate with us? And she does all of that in this short compact poem. I know I skipped ahead a little bit in the interest of time, but I do wanna go back where she says here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. The lines prior to something has tried to kill me and has failed is her talking about the existence between starshine and clay, literally between two worlds in some ways, right? Between the creation of herself and then perhaps the damnation of uh, death, what comes with that. But also I think there's something happening here about being terrestrial. What does it mean to exist on this earth? This bridge between the spiritual and um, the celestial, the, the bridge between all of that when I'm here in flesh, right? And we thinking about what I said about Hortense Spillers, the body versus the flesh. When I'm on this bridge in this place between two identities um, that exist outside of this, this racial um, gendered flesh, um, this is who I am. Um, and my one hand holds tight my other hand and joins those together. So she invites you one last time, returning to, to you, the reader, right? The semicolon marks that, come celebrate with me. It's like, I went off and told you about who I was for a little bit, and now you definitely know that you should come celebrate with me because every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Um, <clears throat> what this poem becomes, considering Lucille Clifton's life, and this was published in the 90s, some sources say she wrote it in the 60s and didn't publish it until the 90s, but what it becomes, um, like I, I mentioned before, for Black women, it's significant, thinking of Hortense Spillers and, and everything I just mentioned historically. But personally for Lucille Clifton, she was very sick um, for a good bit of her life. Uh, she had several bouts of, bouts of cancer, dialysis until her kidney transplant. She endured childhood trauma. Um, she was a trigger warning. She was molested as a child um, and she writes about that openly. Um, there's ancestral trauma we get about her, her mother, her grandmother, um, and also what it is to be black in America. Um, the loss of her home at one point and deaths of her mother, husband and two children during her lifetime. And so she's also talking about literally um, the cancer inside of her, uh, things that have absolutely attempted to break her and how she is still present. So it's also, um, I don't want us to lose that this also is a confession of the way that she is able to celebrate her own life. And she's open with that, with, she's open with her reader about that in her body of work. And so why then do we separate this from that as well? Thank you, Professor Jackson. Thank you. You cover, you cover so much and it, it's a beautiful segue. Um, uh, I just wanna share with those who may or may not be familiar um, uh, with the intersection of uh, religious studies and literature, thinking about theology and, and uh, Black women's uh, literary tradition, that um, uh, one, of the, one of the things and the primary uh, objectives for me as a theologian, one who speaks, writes, uh, thinks about God taught confessionally, so not just as an academic study, um, but as an exercise of faith. Um, Lucille Clifton's intent is important. Um, and this is not, not just important because she's an author and we're kind of taught within Western methodologies to be thinking uh, in post-structuralist space about what's important for the author 
other, um, but also how these words are speaking, um, what, who are the black women, what is the ancestral pantheon that she is carrying forth with her in these words. Um, and so uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Professor Jackson for your presentation because it also covered <laughs> some things I was over here just scratching out um, um, and thinking particularly about um, Lucille Clifton's whole uh, discussion in her memoir about the Dahomey women uh, and uh, how significant this is as a part of her, her living, her living in, in today. So one of the things that I want to um, focus on is something that uh, Lucille Clifton mentioned uh, in an interview in uh, 95. She defined poetry as a way of living in the world, a way of trying to come to peace with the world. Uh, she further clarifies this definition of poetry when she uh, goes on to state that poetry is not about answers, but about questions that uh, she shares with her students or shared with her students that you come to poetry, not out of what you know, but out of what you wonder. And so one might ask, uh, what was the poet laureate of Maryland wondering about um, so much that a poem such as you know, won't you celebrate with me would come to her. Uh, one can interpret, won't you celebrate with me uh, as the use of irony as a literary device. Um, I leave the literary scholarship to you, Professor Jackson, <laughs> and jump in uh, as a theologian and thinking about uh, what this means for us, um, not only the lives of black women, but um, as we're thinking about the lives of Black women within a predominantly white institution that is also contemporary and Catholic, right? So we do a whole lot of work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do a whole, a whole lot uh, <laughs> within the next 12 minutes or so. Um, um, but I want to uh, raise one, what are the existential uh, and spiritual questions that um, are not only uh, prompting such a poem, a poetic offering, but also what are the more questions that come up because of the poem um, about what it means to be human um, and how we can pull from, as a contemporary Catholic institution, from our uh, wellspring um, of theologians uh, within the Catholic tradition to help make sense of, um, of what we find in the poem. And so I'm gonna invite uh, not only one, lift up some of the existential questions that arise that are also spiritual questions, uh, but secondly, to then uh, discuss and invite um, Thomas Aquinas as a conversation partner on theological virtue. And I uh, like to propose, as I often do, um, uh, in a womanist fashion, womanist being privileging the experiences and voices of Black women um, as uh, cultural and uh, spiritual resources um, for thinking about God talk and the way that we talk about God and faith. Um, in typical womanist fashion, uh, interpreting this poem as an argument for survival um, and survival intelligences to be virtuous. What does it mean for survival to be a theological virtue? So with that being said, I'll um, uh, begin by saying um, and picking up what Pro Professor Jackson kind of left off in terms of uh, noting um, uh, Lucille Clifton's genealogy that she's named after her great grandmother, Lucy, um, a descendant of the Dahomey, Dahomey people uh, of what is now present day Benin. Uh, the Dahomey tribe, as Professor Jackson noted, were known for its some 6,000 at its heyday, uh, women warriors. And uh, likewise, uh, Clifton's great grandmother Lucy fought on several occasions to preserve her own life uh, and the life of her children. 
Um, this is just a bit of what we know of the Africana ancestral wellspring uh, from which Clifton is drawing uh, to help us with one of the most profound, what I understand to be one of the most profound spiritual and existential questions uh, that bears a great deal of significance for us on today. And that is um, uh, particularly from a black woman's perspective, uh, what does it mean to be a human being who chooses to exist? each day making a choice to exist and persist in a world that is anti-Black, anti-woman, and allows the defilement and devaluation of Black women's bodies and their communities. Again, uh, this existential question, it's existential because it's a question of being, uh, but it's also very much uh, spiritual when we begin to think about uh, Lucille Clifton's um, ancestral heritage, but also the spirituality that she's inherited and is um, embodying and even constructing uh, through her work. While the poem seems to intimate uh, such a question, such as what does it mean to be human and to choose to exist, persist in a world that's anti-Black, anti-woman and allows for the defilement and devaluation of Black women's bodies, um, this poem poses this, yet as uh, I, I would encourage us in a contemporary Catholic institution to think about what does it mean to be made in the image of God, or, and I'll quote Aquinas here as well as Clifton, the light, uh, capital L, yet socially constructed. Uh, to be, quote, on the bridge between starshine and clay, is to bear the light or the divinity of the infinite within the confines of finitude or finite. Uh, there is the rhetorical device of irony and I'll just describe it as juxtaposition as I'm interpreting it. Uh, the dialectic of the infinite and the finite concerns itself with how is God, how is the divine, how is the eternal light in relationship with creation? How is the infinite showing up in the flesh? Uh, as a womanist theologian, um, I am always compelled and wedded to thinking about promoting God talk uh, that is uh, embodied and that is life affirming as opposed to the death dealing theology of white supremacist American Christianity that has all these pictures of white Jesus. And if you aren't proximate to it, then uh, you bear uh, hell as a part of your, <laughs> literally on your skin. Um, consider survival to be a theological virtue. Um, just as um, God intervenes, and I'm using a, a womanist biblical and theological hermeneutic here, um, I take seriously the biblical witness of enslaved African women. And so I do lift up Hagar. I lift up uh, our womanist theologian uh, who teaches many of us uh, in this area, Dolores S. Williams, and her read of Hagar um, and the analogous relationship to enslaved African women um, in America and their descendants is that salvation for the oppressed of the oppressed, Salvation for black women is much different and looks different than it does for white men, white women, and black men, just as, uh, um, and others of, of other subjectivities. It looks different and it looks more like survival than liberation. When Clifton notes um, the power and activity of her hands as being inclusive, and I quote, my hand holding, uh, tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day, every day, so this mundane um, uh, visitation on um, threat of non-being and death, that something has tried to kill me and has failed. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a flippant um, uh, uh, exposure of the intent of evil that is countered by the triumph of the divine intent, which is to preserve life. 
um, just as God intervenes on behalf of Hagar, the oppressor of the oppressed, to ensure her survival on two different occasions uh, in scripture. So have black women, Clifton herself, and other oppressed women found, find our survival through divine providence. And it's, but it's not a divine providence that is, um, uh, that is empty of human agency. And so part of it is celebrate with me, but you also see me and be able to celebrate <laughs> the triumph of divinity that preserves my life um, through intent, through the fight of uh, her great grandmother, Lucy, that made it possible for her to even be here. Um, and, and so we think about how Clifton is taking seriously uh, the personal threat uh, that um, the incarnation of white racial narcissism poses to black women and their communities um, through economic depravity, through the provision of resources um, uh, for survival, black people doing for themselves, but, but largely black women, black women leading this um, counters. So we have divine creativity that, that finds black life defensible and worthy of, um, of not only being um, uh, defended by others in such a Black Lives Matter uh, fashion, but we're talking about um, a Black woman who finds her life, um, uh, that her life matters. And so when we think about the significance, I think about um, in my pastoral experience, how hard it was um, during a retreat for black women to, we, as we were circling uh, in a circle and to be able to hold up a mirror and to look at themselves and say, I am of sacred worth and my life matters. Not a problem being able to say that about other persons in the community, but tears and struggle to be able to say, I, Michelle, or I, Abigail, whatever the name was, um, to be able to say that my life matters. So this is a set, this is a triumph of community. It's a triumph of not only survival, but a triumph of uh, the decision to um, fully embody the infinite within the confines of finitude. First question comes from Max and the second one comes from Lizzie. Uh, I was wondering how this poem was perceived um during its time of being published and if it became more popular after her passing? It was perceived well, like I said, uh, some sources say she wrote it in the 60s, which makes sense in the way that her work progressed and shifted over her lifetime. Um, but it was published in her collection that, uh, that came out in the 90s. She read it on numerous occasions during her life and uh, often to standing ovations, <laughs> I'll say that. So it was received well. Um, I think initially, I will, I will say this, if she had been able to publish it in the 60s, um, it would have been received well in the, to, by the community, specifically Black women, uh, that she was writing to, right? I think the 90s, we have on um, that second wave of feminism that occurred, right? White feminism occurred. And so you have all of that um, in those ways in which um, white women as well or were able to, in some ways, uh, co-opt <laughs> this message as well. And I think uh, because of who she was, mind you, I told you she was a highly decorated poet. Um, I think all of that made it so people felt like they had no other option but to celebrate her, whether they you know, were with everything she was writing or not. But to answer your question, it was received extremely well. Ms. Flanders. And I just had a question about the structure of the poems. You mentioned a couple of times that she didn't really use punctuation and she didn't use capitalization. And I was wondering if you could go more into the significance of that. Sure, thank you for your question. Um, it, it's, it's easier to do so when looking at a specific piece. I will say that, you know, talking about how those, uh, those choices impact the theme and the message of that particular poem. Overall, uh, I think she was absolutely concerned with, um, as I mentioned briefly, understanding that we're all connected, right? She, she spoke often about how uh, violence against Black folk would occur, literally murder, and how the earth would cry out, 
how the birds would be different that day, um, how the soil would feel different. So she writes often about how the whole entire uh, earth, the cosmos mourns the loss of um, black life as well. And so lowercase, like you choosing to write in lowercase um, just amplifies that message, right? It's that there's no I that's bigger than anything else present in this poem. And uh, the choice, I would say, that in, without having a, an entire lecture dedicated to it, the choice to, to not use periods, right? I think um, I teach this in my class. It simply means that the, the poem never really ends, right? It, it encourages you to believe that this idea is not final. There's nothing final about this. Um, this is you stepping into the world of the poem for a bit and going back into um, your own world, but that you could come back to this reality at any given moment. Um, so the idea that this is cyclical, that this continues to exist and that the poem never ends. Uh, the choice to include periods, as we all know, when we first learn how to use them in kindergarten, right? A period marks the end of a sentence, the end of an idea, something definite. Uh, what Clifton, as um, Dr. Watkins brought up, she did say that um, you come to poetry out of what you wonder, not out of what you know. And a period, I think, says something about what you absolutely know. And she's like, well, we don't really know anything, but we continue to wonder as long as we have breath in our bodies and the work exists outside of myself in the world forever. So anytime someone comes to it, they're coming out of what they wonder as well. So I was wondering, you mentioned Professor Jackson, um, how like when people were giving her reviews and stuff, it was like, it didn't get into the depth of her character and stuff. So I was wondering if like, like as time progressed, people started to like, um, how did I word it? If she like received greater recognition for the power of emotion and expression in her poetry versus like the shallower, like, oh, this is good aspects. Yeah, I, I wanna say, um, so she received recognition um, for how powerful the work was, right? And people often would say it was so moving. What Toni Morrison was getting at is that people were often, even in the critical uh, realm, uh, were often just so focused on how she was able to move them um, and how she could come and fix things for them. But they didn't talk about her intellect. They didn't talk about how smart um, how crafty, how studied she was as a poet. And that was the critique and the criticism that Morrison was looking for. She's like, you know, we can talk about um, Yeats all day. We can talk about T.S. Eliot all day and say what they're doing with line breaks and word choice. And But when it comes to Lucille Clifton, we're like, oh, she just makes the world a better place. Doesn't she look at how beautiful these words are and this just make us feel so great. Um, and so she was calling for a stronger critique in that way. Um, what you do get a little bit of, I mean, uh, and what she was saying, she didn't say that it doesn't exist at all. She's saying the overwhelming majority of criticism places her in a mammy position. And that's just not what she's doing. And she's calling for more theory, more, um, more, I'm trying to think of the right word, but more careful critique of her as an artist and less of the persona. People see a larger um, black woman who has all these children smiling at them and telling them that, you know, the world has evil in it, but celebrate with me. And they automatically put her in this specific um, trope. And so that was what she was um, arguing for. And now there are articles that do that. Um, I will say to answer some of your, well, to continue to answer your question, black women, ironically, so Rita Dove, Elizabeth Alexander, there are black women poets who do provide that critique of her um, and are doing that work. Um, you also have Kevin Young, uh, who was an editor for one of her collections, her collected. So Black poets are doing that for her. And there are a handful of white scholars you can find on JSTOR if you go on Google who've done that work. But the overwhelming majority of critique and criticism you'll find from the poetry world does place her in a mammy trope. Yeah, do you think a lot of her work came to light again after her 9-11 poem was written? Because I know that was like a really well-known poem. Um... Oh, see, this is, you're asking a, a larger question. Um, she, you're asking a question about how people read poetry. That's why I'm like, I, I didn't sorry. know if, like, if her older work like became very popular again, again, after her 9-11 uh, poem. Yeah, um, and again, at the heart of that question is how people read poetry, right? So uh, something happens in the world, like we can see it happening now with COVID. Uh, we can see it happening with Black Lives Matter. 
We can see it happening with Breonna Taylor. And um, people reach for, they reach for something um, when the rest of the world doesn't have the answers and when they themselves can't find the answers. Like Lucille Clifton says, you come to poetry out of what you wonder. People are wondering things and know that nobody has a definite answer and they want to know that there is something, there is some artist somewhere out there who can speak to them, right? Similar to often how people come to faith in times of uh, crisis, <laughs> right? Um, and so to answer your question, sure. I mean, you're asking if popular culture then started to reach for her again. And I'm sure that happened, absolutely. Um, but there are some people who never lost interest in her. But I do think in the same way, which is why it's significant for any poet um, who we, we ever come to celebrate, we come to celebrate them out of the fact that they document our lives for us in some way, shape or form. And so she continued to do that. She wrote about um, the civil rights movement that was happening was very, wrote about her hips, her homage to my hips is a, a famous one of hers, wrote about her body and being a woman during a time when people were concerned and interested um, in bringing to light women's issues. Um, and then she wrote about 9-11 during that time. So yes, those poems did make people interested in her again, I guess I'll say. Uh, but it doesn't mean that she ever really went anywhere, if that makes sense. But yeah, to answer your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, I have a question from Dejan. I'm sorry, Jackson. I'm sorry, Dejan. Jackson and then Dejan. Um, mine's kind of long, so I typed it out. So I said, um, some of Clifton's work comes from the period of the civil rights movement and most of it from post-civil rights movement. Um, do you believe that despite some of the progress made for Black Americans, her work regarding her struggle and identity as a Black woman in America was inspired by the events of the Civil Rights Movement? Dr. Watkins, did you want to take some of that? Um, so it sounds like you're asking uh, the extent to which her work being influ influential to, influenced by, and or to. The civil rights movement? By, yeah. Influenced by the civil rights movement. So I think one of the things um, that uh, when we think about her, was in her first text is published in 69. And so this is right after the um, assassination, not even a whole year after the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which was devastating uh, for the world. Um, and uh, there is also a period where um, uh, the righteous indignation of freedom fighters, particularly within um, what would eventually become known as the black community at that time, um, uh, was forming itself out of a uh, political resistance that this country did not see in a post-emancipation world from black people. And what I mean by that is um, an open, uh, in-your-face confrontation with, um, um, with white supremacy, with uh, police brutality, and particularly dealing with uh, poverty. And um, so, so one of the things, actually, one of my one of my favorite pieces is her wish her uh, wishes to her sons, because um, she just she just goes she just goes real hard. And, and she's, not, she's not your warm and fuzzy. You know, she's, she's really not your warm and fuzzy um, uh, uh, liter literary uh, figure. And I say this to say that a part of her being influenced by that time and that space is not just surviving and thinking about um, uh, the posture of resistance that needs to be embodied during that particular time, but also when you think about what she and her family of origin were able to see and survive. So while she's Northern, she has Southern, these Southern roots. And so she's very much privy to uh, the experience of lynching. She has this very deep familial connection uh, with lynching. And she's also familiar with the way that Northern life involves um, a more sophisticated forms of lynching. And this is, uh, so she's, she's countering um, not only the racial uh, prejudice, but also an, um, an uh, volition that comes from anti-Black racism, but also anti-Black and anti-woman uh, sentiments that are there. And so she's influential because she's a particular 
a black woman that is asserting her voice in both of these different circles. Um, uh, countering, and this is why proto <laughs> persons might identify her as proto womanist in terms of the way that she confronts the whiteness um, um, that is being upheld uh, on a national front, but also in particularly the, the racism even within the, femi the budding uh, feminist movement at the time. I hope that helps Jackson. So I want to be mindful of time. This program was until five o'clock. It is 502. So if you have to go, then you know feel free. You don't have to feel awkward for logging off. But if you'd like more conversations, I don't think uh, Professor Jackson or Dr. Watkins would mind answering some of the questions that were still lingering. Um, but thank you for coming and please look out for other programs that we'll have through the Humanity Center in the spring semester. Dejan, did you still want your question answered here? Oh, you yeah. Are. Oh, yeah, no, I, you are. I'm still uh, here. Your question was about, oh, you can you can re rephrase it, rehash it. Yeah, uh, it was just about one of her titles as a poet. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, laureate. Uh, it was mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, what exactly does that mean? And um, how much of an effect did that have on her community at the time? Uh, I, I can take it. Um, who, uh, so Poet Laureate, um, and we have one for the U.S., so that office um, is as small as the individual state um, and also cities, uh, Philadelphia, where I come from, we have, you know, ours as well. Uh, so I believe Sonia Sanchez was our first one, but um, cities uh, and states can have their own, and then so can uh so, sorry, so does the United States, um, but it's a person who's honored basically, like, so it's an honor, honored with the award of being named uh, the poetic speaker, if you will, for that particular region, area, like I said, city, state, U.S. What that office looks like and how that uh, selection process or award process is tailored is it depends on that state, that city, like it depends on the office basically. So of course, in order to uh, be awarded the Poet Laureate of the US, it's much more involved. <laughs> uh, a panel of people sit together and, and decide, you know, who to extend that honor to. And they actually, you have to come up with your own agenda uh, as well and what you, what these next few years are gonna look like. Um, and so there's different projects you have to have. Um, when it comes down to the state level, that can vary. And actually Lucille Clifton, uh, being who she was, uh, she pushed against some of the things they wanted her to do. She said, like, my, I'm not here to, to write poems for new openings of malls. She's like, that's not what I do. Um, so uh, there's a way that um, the poet, depending on like Baltimore, um, was new to having a laureate, right? And they're like, okay, we want it to be Lucille Clifton. And we might want you to come and do uh, different readings at these different events. And she's like, ah, no, <laughs> like I, that's not what that's going to look like. But on whatever anniversary of the state, yes, I will. I will write a poem for that. So in a lot of ways, it's an award um, that has different, whatever, however that role is defined is how that role is defined. That's the best way to say it. But you do, in, in a lot of ways, represent and you're representative of uh, that state in a way or that city. Um, and for the U.S., of course, there's there's projects that they have to take on and produce at the end of it. So we had Tracy K. Smith, who actually came to USD um, during her her tenure um, as U.S. Poet Laureate, I believe right now is Joy Harjo. Um, but Tracy K. Smith did a podcast, which I believe is still going, um, and also uh, different projects around the U.S. Right, making sure she's amplifying this voice about what's happening. When we had Natasha Trett, the way she talked about Katrina and did different, talked about healthcare and wrote poems about that. Um, so all that, it all depends on, on what it looks like, depends on what that particular role uh, looks like, what the, what the parameters are, if you will. But it's an honor, that's the biggest thing. I have two Thank more you. questions. One from Rochelle and one from Dr. Floyd. And then we're, we can go. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just curious to get your interpretation on the lines, my one hand holding tight, my other hand. Um, I initially assumed that it was prayer, 
um, that she was referring to. Um, but then I, you know, her words seem much deeper than that. So it seems like maybe it sh it's not that straightforward is what she's referring to. Um, and so I kind of saw it as, uh, you know, somebody who has gone through her experience and her journey and especially being a mother of six children, um, that it's, it was more kind of like a, you know, when you're at, you reach a point where you're just kind of resolute and calm and just expressing yourself. So kind of like she's holding her, her hand in the other, just kind of as, as like a mom would talking to her children, like, listen, <laughs> you know, so I wanted to, I, I wondered if either of those is what you interpret those lines are, or if it's something completely different. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump on that and then I'm going to let, I'm gonna let the, the literary scholar do that. Um, the, there is a, um, uh, because I have a contemporary music mindset, I think of the words of Erica Badu in Bag Lady, okay, uh, where she says, I guess nobody ever told you all you must hold on to is you, is you, is you. And so, uh, for me, because it's all about interpretation in terms of reader, readership and who your readers are, um, it's about self-worth, self-love, um, and how self-love is necessary in order for self-preservation to even be a reality. Professor Jackson. No, thank you, Dr. Watkins. No, I mean, I feel like it's layered. Uh, absolutely. And I, I'm here for the Erica Badu reference. I think that is perfect honestly uh definitely about uh, if we look at sorry so i'm gonna i'm trying to talk about it without bringing it back up but she says my one hand holding tight right that's the line and there's a break my other hand semicolon come celebrate so because of course syntactically that is it flows right there, my one hand holding tight my other hand we get that image we get the image of holding on to yourself right um, and holding tightly onto yourself, um, which I think does give a nod to uh, self-preservation, um, self-celebration, <laughs> right? Uh, but also what it means that um, I'm holding tightly onto what I, to get to the point of being able to celebrate myself because Lucille Clifton is quoted as saying, um, one should celebrate more than they wish to be celebrated. So I'm at this point, not any longer asking or seeking celebration or recognition from anybody else, right? I, I celebrate myself and I'm holding tightly onto this place um, in which I'm holding tightly onto myself in the place that I had to get to be here, mm -hmm. right? Who I am today right now is who I'm holding tightly on, onto. But I think also with the line break, which is why Toni Morrison's line just works for me, the simplicity of an atom, right? Because it looks like we can read right through it and get what we need. But we also have my one hand holding tight, my other hand come celebrate. Yeah. And then you get the image of literally, and I don't think it's, it's me making anything, right? You get a black power, like my right hand holding tight. And then you have my other hand saying celebrate. Right. So you get the fist, you get someone saying, I will, I'm ready to fight for this place I'm not letting go of this space that I've established for myself. But with the other hand, I am inviting you to celebrate, but don't forget that, you know, don't miss this hand for one minute. This hand is not hidden. <laughs> you see it, but you're also invited to come celebrate with this other hand. Right. And so we get all of that um, pre pre presented in those lines. I know Dr. Watkins has to go. I'm going to say thank you. Um, and that will be the last question for Dr. Floyd. Thanks for allowing me to be a part of this. This was a, absolutely amazing. I do deeply appreciate this respect for such an amazing poet. Um, there's a poem of hers that I've been enamored with for years, and it's The Atlantic is a Sea of Bones, in it where she paints the body of water as a seaway paved with the bones of the bodies of enslaved Black women and children who often jumped ship or were thrown overboard in their way to the so-called, you know, Americas. Um, the last lines though are lines I've never really known what to do with. So I wanted to throw them out here and see what you could help me with here. And the lines are, I call my name into the roar of surf and something awful answers. 
And you just you just want to know what we think about those? I really do. I really do. I've never known what to do with those lines. They take me in a number of directions simultaneously. And quite frankly, leave me bereft of words. Yeah, I mean, on some real, that's the simplicity of the Adam part, right? I think, um, I feel like there's a lot there without having the whole thing, because I'm familiar-ish with it. But um, without having the whole thing in front of me, just focusing on those, um, I am, there's a lot of images I have in my head. One of um, like ritual by water. Yeah, you know, um, calling calling your name. It, it seems to me to be some type of like ri religious, ri like the ritual and honoring of the ancestors. Yes, I'm calling my name into the sea of surf, calling my name um, it, again with the, what did I say? But I, I guess that's, right? Like a self-reclamation of sorts. I know who I am and I'm calling my name, right? I'm not calling their names. I don't know their names. So she's telling us that too. I don't have their names to know. I have mine and I know that they're there. So I call my name into the sea of surf. And number one, I do get an answer, but it's something awful. And it makes me wonder about, um, because knowing that Lucille Clifton believed that the those who have passed on have active afterlives, right? She she said that she spoke to, spoke to her mother through a Ouija board regularly. Um, and sometimes her mother would say, I don't have time today. <laughs> I have other things to do. And so with that knowledge, I'm thinking about the truth that she may have heard all of them at once. And that by itself is making my heart break right now. Like that would be terrifying to hear every single one of your ancestors um, and those ancestors you didn't have the opportunity, those who aren't ancestors, but who are part of like fictive kinship ancestors, if they all were to answer you when they hear your name um, with their stories, with their truth, what that would what that would feel like. And I know this, I mean, being honest, I think um, being on the East Coast, I remember the day I realized, I'm like, oh, this is the Atlantic? <laughs> like, wait, like this, this that we swim in every day? And I have a poem about that, but, um, because you know, no, there's no new matter, right? So there, and because of oceanic residence time, those bodies, the matter of those bodies is still there. And so if we eat blue crab, which I do, if we consume any fish or anything that comes out of that water, there we're consuming parts of their bodies. Like it's still there. Um, and so I think that's what she's making us think about. Like, what does it mean that I call my name? Cause that's all I have. All I have is my name out into this this place this burial ground this wet watery burial ground and it, of course it makes me think of a oh gosh um zong by emner Bay state philip um and what she writes about but i call my name out and then they all just all of them answer at once and something terrifying i i well yeah like <laughs> I'm, I'm, i never sat with that line like this and it is literally bringing me to tears right now but i don't dr dr Watkins, what do you have um, so I was just uh, fascinated in thinking about um, what it would be, Dr. Floyd, to read uh, Atlantic as a Sea of Bones alongside another short, short poem, uh, Cruelty, Don't Talk to Me About Cruelty, um, because I, I think they pair very well in terms of thinking about her imagination um, uh, of what was, what has been, and a lingering experience of agency yet within the space of cruelty. So I'll just leave, leave that there. This has been such a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jackson. And thank you, friends, for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, thank you for the question, Dr. Floyd. Thank you for those who stayed to spend more time sharing and talking with us. And again, we'll have more of these types of events uh, centering the voices of Black literary authors and, and writers in the spring semester. And I hope you'll attend those as well.